I'm Leslie Warren. I'm the Dean of Library and Instructional Support. I'll be our moderator today, helping to silence Jane if she goes too long, or to silence John if he does, <laughs> uh, and to be the voice of the questions. Fair enough? Fair yeah. enough. Okay. Well, let's go ahead then and get started. Okay. So um, it is my honor to be part of today's Sonderager program, which is uh, sponsored by the Sonderager family with a generous endowment to Northern Michigan University. Our topic today for the Sonderager is insider and outsider. This particular session is uh, featuring prisoners of war and conscience, conscience during World War II. We'll start with Jane Kopecki, who is the, a graduate of Manistique High School, received her BA and MA from Northern Michigan University, and is a retired educator. Jane's recent book, World War II Conscientious Objectors, Germfast, Michigan, the Alcatraz Camp, received the Historical Society of Michigan Award for Private Printed Book. Uh, she's also the author of Huntsburg and Along the Tracks, which tells the history of a small upper Michigan community at the turn of the 20th century. So Jane, I'll turn things over to you and then John, I'll introduce you in about 20 minutes or so. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do I have to press any buttons or this is the way it goes? Uh, do you want to share any sort of PowerPoint slides or do you- I do have a couple pictures that I'll be showing. So to do that, what you'll be doing is sharing your screen. Um, are you comfortable with that or do you need me to walk you through it? No, nope, sharing screen's fine. I've okay. got it. All right, in that case, uh, you're ready to go. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted that I can share this piece of unique and neglected piece of uh, World War II history. Um, World War II, was the first time in US history that conscientious objectors were uh, recognized mm -hmm. by the United States government and did not have to uh, participate in the armed forces. And little is known about the World War II, 151 World War II conscientious objectors camps that were located throughout the United States. And very few people know about a special camp in Germfask, Michigan, where the most troublesome and uh, political dis dissidents were sent. A 1950 government document reveals, and this is a quote, this unit was set up in cooperation with the Michigan State Board of Mental Hygiene to make observations and study of non cooperative objectors. So how did the uh, men receive this conscientious objectors uh, status? There's three uh, churches, they're called the historic peace churches, the Mennonites, the Brethren, and the Quakers, and they actively encourage their men not to participate in war. And uh, as a result of their lobbying Congress, um, they were eliminated entirely from the armed forces for the first time. But in lieu of um, induction, they would have to do work of national importance under the direction of the churches. The program was called Civilian Public Service. Two th our 12,000 men opt to go into the, we'll call it CPS, Civilian Public Service. Uh, they are not to be confused with the 12, uh, 22,000 that went in to the armed forces in non-combatant duty. Now, to be admitted into the CPS program, every man had to pay the government $35 a month, supply all their own food and clothing and necessities. And in addition, they had to sign a document releasing the government of any responsibility for any injuries that they received while they were working on the CPS program. So it was a tremendous burden for the churches. The government supplied the work and the churches were responsible for the behavior and the records of the men. Some men worked on farms, some worked in mental institutions, 
Some worked out west in the forest fire smoke dumping unit. Some volunteered to be human guinea pigs in medical research, but the majority were uh, assigned to work in remote areas on federal government land, and they were housed in former CCC camps, civilian conservation camps. There were no armed guards and there were no guns. It was an honor system. The first camp was opened in Grottos, Virginia, where the men worked for the Soil Conservation District under the Mennonite Church. And when that camp became full, or when a camp became full, usually about 100 men, another camp would be opened. And because the churches had to accept every man that was classified as a CO, they became a holding tank for those few men who refused to cooperate with the system. Most of these men were intelligent with college degrees and they were persuasive in their debates against conscription and war. And they found nonviolent ways to buck the system. To prevent them from uh, causing unrest in the camps, the government decided to open uh, their own selective service camp. The first one was in Mancos, Colorado. Here, the $35 a month was eliminated. They were not, uh, and the government supplied their food, their clothing, and all their necessities, and they were paid $5 a month for their labor. And I have a picture of a few of, oops, where'd it go? Um, this here are some of this, this is a few of the men that eventually were transferred to GermFask. And this is another group. This is- uh, uh, Jane, Jane yeah. we can't see your images yet. Yeah, we're not, we're not seeing them. Oh, you're not, oh my. Hmm, I wonder what's going on. Do you, do you see the screen share button down oh, below? Oh, I missed that. Okay, let's go back. Uh oh, can I get back? Here we go. I'm out. Okay. Um, shoot. Oh, my, my, my. Okay, I'll do this. Am I still on? You're still on, but we yep. can't see the images. Okay, but I can't see my, I can't see myself. Where'd I go? Oh, goodness, and I practiced this so much. <laughs> uh, what kind of computer are you using? That might tell us how to find your screen. I am um, using uh, HP. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, is that where you see all of the icons for your applications? Yes. And then do you see the little video camera for Zoom? I you do. A little, if you click on that. Okay, I, I am and I see you. If you see me, we're probably in pretty good shape. So do you see from that screen then down toward the bottom, do you see something that says share screen? Not on yours. Green no. icon. Oh my. Oh, my, my. <laughs> well, if you want, you can keep talking to us and just describe the photos. Okay, well, we'll just, we'll just go ahead then. Eventually, maybe during the other period, I might be able to show yeah. a few of them. Okay. Okay. So, uh, to prevent them, can you see me? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay, to prevent them from causing unrest in the camps, the government opened this uh, Mancos, Colorado camp. And uh, the men's behavior did not improve. So they, to further isolate them, um, the government opened the second camp in Lapine, Oregon. And the COs became more creative in their nonviolent protest and more determined to undermine the CPS system. So, the, um, a special camp was opened for them in Germfast, Michigan. The trouble began the day the first men arrived. Or I should say before that, the uh, men were coming, um, were going to be in a, a vacated CCC camp on the outskirts of Germfast. Uh, 
They were to work um, at the Senior National Wildlife Refuge under the direction of uh, Mr. Johnson, the, the uh, refuge foreman. Uh, Reverend Osborne, the local Mennonite minister, was uh, to be their, their uh, mentor and, and uh, in charge of the men. And there were some paid government employees. And they were expecting the um, COs to be willing workers. And it wasn't until the night before the first men arrived that Secret Service informed them that this uh, was a group of men, their main job, uh, they were troublemakers, and that the main job of uh, these men was to keep detailed records on them in hopes that they could gain enough evidence to uh, send them to prison. And the trouble uh, began immediately. Uh, Senior Refuge Manager Johnson states, at 1235, the froth of highly educated chit chat, rudely silenced by the sound of a clanking chains and a shattering voice claiming, this is slavery. It was Bishop, a veteran of five camps putting on his act, the main feature of which were a ball and a chain and a string of quotations. Bishop was a tradition with the traditional beard of the prophets and other stage effects. We learned that Bishop was just a fair sample of the COs selected for this camp. The first week, the first week, several of the men walked to the local Jolly Inn bar and had a beer. And the natives were shocked. They were thinking these were religious Mennonites. Then they heard rumors that the men refused to work. And they despised these men they called draft dodgers. Rumors then began to spread that Reverend Osborne had invited them into the community. Uh, vandalism occurred in the Mennonite church. Then threats were made to tar and feather him and burn down the church, and he was forced to leave town. In Newberry, a mob of approximately 150 people planned to lynch several of the COs. They barely escaped. Emotions were really high. And so here, I wish I had my video. Um, the men in Germfask, who were they? Uh, Don DeVault, he brought national attention to Germfask when the Washington Post carried an editorial, The Pangs of Conscience. He was a biochemist. He earned a PhD at Stanford University in California and was working on penicillin research. Instead of allowing him to continue his research, he was sent to Germfask and then to federal prison. And he did have the research camp, uh, his research lab set up in Germfask. And then of course, Corbett Bishop, he was the most publicized CO. He went on a 30 day hunger strike at Germfask and it is estimated he fasted a total of 426 days while in federal prisons not including his fast in CPS camps. He was a follower of Gandhi. Other men in the camp were a young Jewish, a, uh, a young man of Jewish background. He experienced much mental harassment for his CO stand. Three blacks, numerous attorneys, several Harvard graduates, college professors, college students, men active in pacifist movements, writers, artists, some uneducated men, and a few totally out of their element. So of the approximately 100 men, 20% stirred up most of the trouble. There were three dorms. Two dorms held the more conventional men. The third dorm held the nonconformist. They called it Tobacco Road and bragged that it was the most publicized dorm of all C CO camps. So how did they protest? Okay, they wanted to publicize their plight to marshal support for their causes, for their uh, cause. They published a camp newspaper, which they sent to all the other CPS camps. They inundated the federal courts, the Michigan Attorneys General, general office and local courts with unlawful detention and imprisonment appeals. 
They wrote representatives, they wrote letters to newspapers explaining their views. Many peace groups worked pro bono for them and among them uh, was Frida Lazarus. She was a strong anti-war activist and she and her husband escorted um, Albert Einstein to the World Peace Conference in Geneva in 1933. Uh, her son, Richard, uh, was a germ fast CO. Um, the men used various techniques to prevent work from being accomplished. It might take all day for one man to sweep out the back of a truck. On the refuge, the work foreman had to give specific directions to saw down a tree with a crosscut saw requiring two men, the foreman would say, you pull, you push. Now you push, you pull. And uh, when they were assigned to cut firewood, uh, one time they uh, took a block of wood and they rounded out the bottom like a rocking chair. They sat on the block and rocked back and forth while they sawed. Uh, because standards of work had not been established, they could not be uh, tried for refusal to work. Uh, they played tricks. When the, uh, when the weather, uh, they weren't supposed to work if it was uh, below zero, so they rigged the thermometer so that it read below zero many days. Uh, when they went to cut firewood, the saws and axes would be missing. Then all of a sudden they'd be back in their proper places. They put themselves on sick leave. The doctor uh, visited them maybe once or twice a week. So if a man put himself on sick leave, the, uh, he wasn't allowed to work until a doctor uh, had a chance to examine him. So the doctor would examine him. And then as soon as the doctor left, they had another ailment and they put themselves back on sick list. Um, the tobacco uh, road dorm, the one, uh, the dorm of the uh, nonconformist was called Tobacco Road, and it was a mess. Max McCauley, a young boy at that time, said, they let me ride my bike through the dorm. One day, a cow strayed into the camp. One of the men put a rope around his neck and brought him into the dorm. He let some cow pies fly. Instead of cleaning up the mess, they made a detour sign on a stick and placed it in the cow pie. They just walked around it. They made jokes out of everything. The camp cooks quit and the men would go into the kitchen and prepare their own food. No one bothered to clean up. The COs, uh, the health department declared the camp unsanitary. The uh, COs disregarded rules concerning leave. Uh, they came and went as they pleased. They were supposed to sign in and out, but the uh, government officials finally gave up on it. Uh, there was one time there was a, a complete chaos. Uh, the uh, Detroit Free Press had a front had a uh, the front page of the Detroit Free Press had uh, in bold print. Um, germ fast campers uh, riot and uh, Leonard Lewis, uh, a germ fast CO uh, told me there was no riot. We couldn't believe the headlines. I wanted to call the newspaper from the camp phone but they wouldn't let us use the phone then they put us on lockdown. And Norm Nelson, the government employee in charge of the camp said there wasn't a riot, the newspapers lied. Many COs walked out of camp as a form of protest, knowing they would be imprisoned. Arden Bodie walked out and was sent to Ashland Prison, prison in uh, Kentucky. Prisons, prisoners were segregated at that time. And he said, they moved me in with the black population. Barnard Rustin was a prison mate of mine. He was a follower of Gandhi and he later became a mentor to Martin Luther King. Al Partridge walked out and while in prison wrote letters to the warden complaining about segregation and then he went on a hunger strike. As a result, he was put into solitary confinement for several months. 
And Jane, I'm going to give you a two minute warning here. Okay, I'm almost there. Because of the publicity, the lack of control and the community hostility, Selective Service decided to close the camp and they were going to move them to Isle Royal, but they decided it was too dangerous in case of an emergency. And so they sent them to a remote camp in um, Northern California where their antics continued until the end of the war. Uh, there's a CCC on M77 in germ, just east of Germfast, you'll see a sign that says uh, CCC camp. Um, and it was vacated in 1945, according to the sign. But that's not true. Uh, the C, the uh, CO was conscientious objectors left in 1945. So there's no acknowledgement of them ever being there. And today it's the site of the big cedar campground. The end. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. Thank you, Jane. It is. Yes, thank um, you very much. I, and I love this pairing, this this topic. So um, we're going to switch over to um, to the other camp that was uh, what about what is it about thirty miles from? I would say Germfast to uh, our train is probably I don't know forty miles, thirty forty miles. It's not you know it's not far. Yeah, close. It so, would be about fifty, yeah. Fifty, oh, okay. Okay. Now mm -hmm. okay. so, yeah, I'm going to try. Uh, oh, go ahead. I, I get You're going to do an introduction. I, I, I will make it quick. No, no, that's all right. John Smolin. You can lie if you want. <laughs> John, oh, I could lie? Yeah. If I had known that before, I would have oh, yeah. a much yeah. more yeah. entertaining introduction. But as it is, <laughs> it's still pretty impressive. Um, so John Smolin, who is itching to get started, um, I'm told was educated at Boston College, the University of New Hampshire, and the University of Iowa. I consider his most important credentials, though, that he is retired as a faculty member from Northern Michigan University, and that his book, Wolf's Mouth, which is, fits in our topic today, won the 2017 mission or was on the list for the 2017 Michigan Notable Books from the Library of Michigan. It is a great read. It was um, one of the Marquette One Book One Community Reads a few years ago. And um, I highly recommend it to anybody who hasn't read it. Now I will turn things over to John Spolins who is itching to get started. Well, th thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm gonna see if I hit this button uh, can everyone see my, uh, my, my, um, yes, can you, you can see yes. that now. All we right. do. We see your wolf's mouth slide. All right. You don't need to see me. I, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, <laughs> anyway, uh, first of all, I want to th uh, thank you for inviting me and, uh, Jane, thank you. Uh, I knew some things about germ fat, the camp in germ fast but I didn't know uh, it in detail as you just described, though it's not surprising. And I'm gonna to try to in some ways dovetail what I'm going to talk about to uh, your presentation because they are, uh, di these camps were different, but they had many similarities, which I, I find really interesting and ironic. Um, first of all, I'm gonna give you uh, quickly, and I, I'm gonna to try to move quickly because of time. Uh, I'll try to give uh, everyone a, a an overview of the camp situation in, throughout the United States to place the ones in Michigan, particularly in the UP in context. Um, this map is inaccurate. Uh, there's not enough dots, but in reality, there were approximately 170 camps throughout the United States. And then there were quite a few more uh, also north of the border in Canada. Um, in Michigan, there were, um, a total of 32 camps. Uh, most of them were in, in the lower peninsula. Five were uh, here in um, this, yeah, five were here in uh, the UP in Autrain, Evelyn, uh, Porai, uh, Reiko, and Sidnaw. Um, and then, as you can see at the bottom there, it mentions Germfest, which was a part of this whole program, but obviously housed a very different kind of prisoner. Uh, I'm going to go through again, try to go quickly. 
some of the camps, uh, as Jane noted, were formerly uh, the CCC camps. So they already had buildings and so forth. In other camps, they really had to construct them from literally from the ground up. And they used, as you can see here, they used tents. They had quite crudely built barracks and so forth. Uh, there's a couple more here. This, this one here is, I think this is in Reiko. And it shows two seasons. Uh, on the left side is the one week of summertime that we have. And on the right side is the rest of the year. The same perspective. Uh, those buildings, those barracks, uh, the siding was um, covered with tar paper and then the vertical lines are metal, uh, wooden battens uh, to hold the tar paper on. Uh, the buildings tended to be uh, not insulated at all or very poorly insulated. Um, this is the interior of one. As you can see, it really does resemble a military barracks. Uh, on the left side, there is a, a wood burning stove. So they did have heat, but as a matter of fact, there's one in the back too. Um, from my reading, it, it just depended on the camp. In many cases, the camps were run in a very military style according to the usual, you know, to boot camp procedures and so forth. Um, uh, some probably were rather uh, uh, not well organized as Jane had mentioned about Germfest, but I think for the most part, because these were prisoners who were from other countries and other armies, primarily Germany and Austria, but there were also Italians and, and uh, men from other European uh, countries. Um, uh, the commanding officers who are part of the prisoner community, they would take control of the camps and they would insist that, you know, things be run in the, the military, uh, according to military organization, as all the men had already been inducted into. So this is a mess hall up at the top and another photograph of, uh, uh, and actually the one, in, this is the dispensary at Germfask at the bottom picture. Um, as Jane noted, uh, here in the Upper Peninsula, these were primarily logging camps. The uh, wood was cut down to be used as pulp wood, which was needed for the war effort. In other parts of the country, particularly in places like Lower Michigan and very heavily going down through the um, Mississippi River Valley, they, the men provided uh, uh, farm labor. They worked in the fields for many farms because men, you know, American men, for, for the most part, were involved in the war effort. So there was a manpower shortage of that nature. Uh, now here, I'm again, I'm going to try to go uh, quickly. Uh, the recreational aspects of these camps uh, were actually more uh, elaborate than you might expect. And one of the most popular pastimes was they played soccer. Uh, in Europe, they often call it football. And in Italian, that word is il calcio, which means football in Italian. And they did allow the, the camps to compete. They would, each camp would have a team and they would compete against each other. And ironically, since Jane had mentioned the Germfast camp with the American uh, um, uh, conscientious objectors. There's a scene in my book, Wolf's Mouth, where the camp in, in Autrain, which was primarily um, inhabited by, well, it was all European soldiers, mostly German and Austrian, and then a few others, Poles, Hungarians, and uh, the narrator of my story actually was a captain in the, in the Italian army. But there was a scene, uh, uh, rather, I hope, sort of an ironically, maybe a little bit humorous scene, where the Germfast soccer team comes to Autrain and they play a match and uh, residents of nearby towns such as Munising and Chatham and Eben and maybe even coming over from Marquette where I live, um, these were Americans and they came and ironically in this story, remember this is fiction, they started to cheer for the European team, the Autrain team against the, C the CEOs were playing for the Germfast team. The CEO team, by the way, and this is purely fictional, they were called the, the C CO Bombers, okay? A sports name that, uh, you know, maybe it's based on what Jane said, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't uh, employ that name. Um, as I said, there are camps uh, throughout the country, a total of over 425,000 prisoners were brought from the European theater to the United States, primarily from 1943 to the end of the war. As the uh, allies 
began to retake um, territory on, continent, on the, the European continent, they ended up having thousands and thousands of POWs uh, that they had to do something with. And they didn't really have the space and the, the, um, uh, the material really to, to and, you know, put them in prisons over there. So what they did is they shipped them over to the United States and they were distributed around to these camps that, that were built very hastily. And uh, as we've already noted, they, they, these men were put to work uh, trying to do some, some of the labor that was needed to uh, provide supplies, whether it was food or lumber for various, um, for the war, war effort, for the United States war effort. The public reaction was mixed. Um, uh, Jane also noted that the CEOs could, um, uh, the CEOs I should say, could um, uh, leave sort of at will. And ironically, the men who um, were in the camps like our train, who were, you know, they were, they were the enemy, the captured enemy. They couldn't come and go at will, but they had remarkable freedom. They often were allowed to go escorted into local towns. Uh, sometimes they would go on, on, you know, they'd go to get supplies and so forth. So forth. Um, they did have considerable interaction with Americans. Um, and so my story to a certain degree is about how odd that felt for both sides, for the Americans to have these Europeans among them. And obviously for the Europeans who felt that they were in a completely foreign and alien environment and surrounded by their enemies, it created certain tensions. But then at the same time, there are points in the story where um, they realize that they have far more in common uh, than uh, they, they originally thought. Um, some places in America, not so much in the UP, I don't think, but there were some places where there was great um, resentment that these camps were set up, particularly in the South. And um, there were uh, some instances where uh, African-American families whose sons and daughters were often serving in, you know, with the American forces, you know, uh, a part of the American uh, war effort. And they resented the fact that the, the POWs in camps who were working in the fields near them were treated better than their sons and daughters were. They were fed better, they were housed better. So there was some resentment there. And as you can see from some of these images, um, uh, there were protests, there were marches and, and, and so forth. Um, I'm gonna go past Glenn Miller because this is, this is in Detroit, this is really uh, not particularly relevant to the story, uh, uh, to the camps up North. Um, but I will tell you this, um, in the story Wallsmouth, as I said, there, um, the story is narrated by uh, an Italian officer whose name is Francesco Giuseppe Verdi. His uh, name is uh, derived from the fact that he was a very distant relative of the famous uh, opera composer Giuseppe Verdi. When he comes to the camp, when he's as a prisoner, he eventually escape, escapes. Uh, and he stays in the United States after the war concludes. And from my research and my reading, uh, a, a very small percentage of the men who came to these camps for one reason or another, one way or another, managed to stay in the United States after the war. Uh, they became enmeshed in American society. They changed their identities. Uh, in Francesco's case, he became Frank Green, if you... Uh, the, the name Verdi means green in many languages. So he became Frank Green and eventually he marries an American woman. Uh, they live in Detroit for years after the war. Uh, and he's, you know, he, he has uh, assumed an American persona. He dresses like an American. He's altered his accent and his, his speech habits so that uh, he really blends in. And it is not until a good 12 years or so later that all of a sudden this facade begins to break down and he realizes that there are people who know who he really was and the past comes back to haunt him in a certain way um, that uh, really follows him throughout his life. This is a story that takes place over the course of 50 years. So in, in this story, this one soldier, this one captured soldier begins his American experience at Autrain, which was a real camp about 25, 30 miles outside of Marquette. 
He goes down to Detroit, and then years later, he ends up back in the UP. His family moves back up there, and the story concludes there. Um, I uh, let's let me see how how are we doing for time? Uh, I don't want to go too long because I know you may uh, want to have some people uh, ask questions. Uh, where are we at oh, with, with time? We're, we're doing okay. Uh, okay. You, you can speak for you know another five to ten minutes, and we'd still have questions. Oh. Time for questions. So oh. far, we have one comment. We don't have any questions posted. Okay. All right. Uh, let me scroll through and see. Uh, well, I'll explain a couple of things. Um, one of the things that I found frankly enjoyable about writing this book was, was the research uh, allowed me to spend a lot of time going into what American life was like in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And um, uh, although much of the story is about this POW camp in the woods in Northern Michigan in the UP, uh, the, the central part of the story takes place in Detroit in the 1950s when uh, Detroit was an absolute booming economy and we were building these incredible automobiles. And like so many Americans, um, uh, Frank Green becomes truly uh, awestruck and enamored with cars that have these enormous fins and these, these, these taillights that look like, you know, re uh, replic try to replicate rocket ships and so forth. So uh, I had a, a really good time uh, selecting some of these photos and trying to incorporate images to show what America was like at that point in time. Um, as you can see, here's some more of the 1950s detail. Uh, and I maybe a little ironically, uh, Frank Green, he's a small, uh, uh, he's a, he has a small business and he's, you know, he's a, uh, he has his own independent business uh, he sells lampshades in a store in downtown Detroit. And the name of the store is Made in the Shade. So part of my research also was to look at sh lampshades that were popular in the 50s. And he wasn't rich, but he made a respectable living selling shades, uh, both retail, you know, out of his showroom. But uh, he often would sell a considerable number of shades to restaurants, um, uh, hotels, places like that um, uh, were really uh, essential to his business. So he was being successful like so many Americans in the 50s. And he, wa he, he wasn't breaking the law. He paid taxes, uh, which is what most of the POWs who did remain in the United States did. Um, if you went back and read research, if you went, went to magazines, newspapers, there used to be articles in major newspapers, in uh, weekly magazines like Look, Look and Life magazine, had articles about these men who suddenly would be found out years after the war had ended. And quite frankly, the US government didn't know what to do with them because um, they learned that there really were no clear laws on the American books that specified what, to be, what was to be done with someone in this situation. Uh, so there are various solutions. The most common one usually, because most of the men were law abiding, as was Frank uh, Green, because they were married to American women, because they often were family men, and because they had businesses and jobs and responsibilities, they were usually told, you must return to your native country, but then you are allowed to um, uh, re request, uh, apply for entrance back into the United States and go through the normal uh, application process uh, to uh, eventually become a, a legitimate US citizen. And many of the men did that. Uh, furthermore, some of the men who were sent back at the end of the war really wanted to come back to the United States. I mean, they, although that when they first came here, they thought Americans, they were brainwashed to think that Americans were these monstrous people who smiled, but were vicious. And I'm not, I'm not, really uh, over uh, overstating that. Many of them came to really appreciate American life for many reasons. And because they were able to mix with Americans, uh, they often uh, sought people that they had befriended while they were here. Once they were back in Europe, they would seek them out and they would ask if they would sponsor them them. Um, again, in my research, there were uh, a number of instances of this, particularly here in the northern Midwest, 
uh, as you probably know, uh, Wisconsin, for example, not to mention parts of Michigan, but Wisconsin has a substantial German American population. And so many of these actual Germans be were befriended by people in uh, Wisconsin towns uh, they could speak their language, you know, the food, you know, they, they, they understood what kinds of food they liked and so forth. So they helped them come back. And uh, for the rest of their lives, there were, there were men who uh, worked and lived in places like Wisconsin and Mich Michigan and over in Minnesota, who had um, been brought back and they became legitimate American citizens and it tr really transformed their lives. Uh, a number of them, uh, many of them are dead now, but a number of them uh, were interviewed and filmed as they were being interviewed. And they really expressed their great appreciation for uh, what they came to realize American life to be. And the fact that they were allowed to come back in and you know, reap the personal benefits that uh, we'd like to think are, are available in our society. Um, uh, Detroit in the 50s. Uh, I'm trying to think where. I'll, all right, the last thing I will mention is that, um, as you also probably realize, there still are to this day, decades after the war is over, there are occasional instances where um, someone who was a part of the, the of, of the German regime, uh, not, they, they were Nazis and so forth somehow managed to change their identity and uh, came here to the United States. And eventually when they're found out, they are suspected of, they are accused of war crimes during the war. And usually this is a protracted process. It takes years of legal wrangling to simply have them extradited back to a certain country in Europe. And then they go through a trial. And this is also part of my story where th this happens in the latter stages. So some of these images here are of uh, uh, real instances where um, these German soldiers who had become American citizens were sent back and they're placed uh, in, in front of a, a um, war tribunal um, in places like Germany and Austria and Israel and so forth. Um, so I think I'll conclude there and uh, hope that maybe we can have a, a bit of a conversation with uh, all of you and, and, and certainly with Jane as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And let me turn my video back on. There we go. So we do have a couple comments so far. I would encourage everybody who is uh, participating and watching us online to post questions or comments in the Q&A for either Jane or for John. The two comments that we've received so far, uh, one, we have an enthusiastic endorsement from Waterford, Michigan for the book Wolf's Mouth as an excellent read. Um, and I, I agree, <laughs> it is a great book. Thank you. Uh, we also have um, some memories and reflections from Dan Hinch. I'm going to read this because he has, he has a, a, a nice um, follow-up regarding the uh, Camp Sidnow. Yeah. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Sidnow? Uh, Sidnow, I think it's Sidnow, I think. Okay. Yeah. So Dan says, I had the chance to be inside the original POW camp library at Camp Sidnall when the Hutala family owned the old camp property. The original guard tower was also standing yet in 2007, now dismantled. My traveling partner that day remembered delivering bakery to Camp Sidnall as a boy with his father who owned Big Joe Bakery in Iron River. He adds that the Huntala family noted that over the years, while they owned the property of Camp Sidnall, they occasionally would hear a soft knock at the office door, and very often there stood a former German POW and his wife and family to thank whoever for the kind treatment and food that he got as a POW there. So uh, Dan Hinch, thanks uh, both John and Jane for, for being here today. Uh, let me just just uh, comment uh, quickly, um, Dan. Thank you. Uh, you know, when Wolf's Mouth came out several years ago, I went around to libraries and schools and bookstores quite a bit, and I gave a, a more extensive version of, of the presentation using this very PowerPoint. On more than one occasion, 
there would be someone, sometimes several people in the, in the audience who were uh, old enough to have been children uh, during World War II. And they would tell you know, uh, their stories about not knowing who these strange men who spoke a foreign language were who were in their town. And they either worked in the, uh, you know, out, out lum lumbering or in many cases if they were from lower Michigan, particularly on the west side of the lower peninsula, they, uh, th these men worked in the fields. And um, they said, you know, in most cases, the interaction between the prisoners and the townspeople was very civil and downright friendly. I mean, they, they, you know, these families would invite these men into their homes for, for coffee, for meals, um, which is uh, a remarkable irony considering that we were at war with these countries at, at that same time. We have a question for Jane. Um, Jane, you mentioned that World War II was the first time that conscientious objectors were recognized. How were they treated in World War I or the Civil War? Oh, there's horror stories. In World War I, uh, they were imprisoned if they didn't go into the armed forces. Where some of them died, they were uh, beaten. Uh, there's one case where uh, two Mennonite men were at an army base out west and they worked in the kitchen. And uh, because they were Mennonites, they didn't have to wear the uniform, but they were harassed. They would uh, they'd be woken up in the middle of the night and they were um, forced to walk around the uh, perimeter of the camp. And then eventually the torture got a little bit worse. Uh, they started chasing them on a motorcycle and they ran over one and killed him. And uh, they just put down cause of death accidental and shipped the body home in a uniform, which was against the uh, Mennonites religion. Yeah. So there's all kinds of uh, horror stories about what happened to them in prison. Uh, and that's just one instance. I could go on and on about that. It's quite gory. Uh, I, I might add that. Oh, so I speaking? You. Uh, all right. I, I might I might add that in the camps such as our train, which was the, the European POWs, uh, when I first started researching this, I thought the real conflict would be between the Amer their American guards and the prisoners. And there, there obviously were there was friction, but by and large, they they got along in, in, in fairly well, frankly. The real uh, difficulties arose within the ranks of the POWs. Uh, the ardent Nazis, and they were a small percentage, but they were they were vehement that all the men in the camp, regardless of what country they were from, that they had to adhere to the strictest Nazi protocols, if you will. Um, and this is where the, the real difficulties, as Jane mentioned, there was there, they if men did not conform to their the Nazis' expectations of uh, as to how they were to behave. Um, they would be tortured. There were men who were killed. And it, it, it could be very gory. And I won't go into the details, but there are some instances described in the book that are really quite horrific. And yet they, they were dealing with their co fellow countrymen. And it was simply because they would not conform to uh, Nazi mm -hmm. expectations. And of course, uh, at the same time we had the conscientious objector camps and the POW camps, we would have had the Japanese internment camps too in the United yes. States. So that's an, that's had... another chapter uh, mm -hmm. you know, in another part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question. Uh, this is from Tina in West Bloomfield. She asks whether any remnants of the POW camps still exist in the UP. Well, well, I'll say that uh, uh, several years ago, when uh, I was I was really honored that, uh, as as Leslie mentioned at the beginning, uh, Wolf's Mouth was selected as the one book, one community selection for Marquette. Uh, they had uh, a number of what I thought were really fascinating um, events surrounding this whole thing. One of them was we had a field trip, which I accompanied. I would say maybe two dozen, twenty six, twenty eight people, on a very nice fall afternoon. We all drove out to Autrain, uh, and I don't remember his name, but there was a man there who lived in that area 
who knew exactly where the camps were. Now, I had been out there some years ago and found hardly any evidence of the camps, but he actually walked us into the woods to places where we saw where fence posts still existed, where there were holes in the ground that had been dug to just throw refuse and, and, and garbage. Uh, and there was one concrete slab that must have been the foundation under one of the buildings. Um, but other than that, uh, the, 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 you know, the forest had really regained that territory. And unless you were paying attention, you wouldn't know that there had been a camp there. Yeah, to add to that, the Hiawatha National Forest has some archeological uh, digs going on there now. All right, and we have one last quick question before, oh, we have uh, Dan Truckee is adding in the comments that there are remnants, including a chimney left from Camp Rako. It's a short yeah. walk from M28. Right, so uh, I, I've heard, I haven't seen that, but I've heard of it, yeah. So if anyone wants to find out more information about that, you can contact Dan at the Beaumere UP Heritage Center, and I'm sure he'd be happy to help you out a little bit more. We have time for one last question. I see our presenters are showing up for the next session, but Ann Fisher would like to know, John, have you published anything else lately? Hi, Ann. Uh, <laughs> Ann Ann's a longtime friend and her, her mom, her wonderful mother is a neighbor of mine. Um, yes, I just had a book come out um, like last month. It's called Day of Days. And it's about, uh, for many of you, or most of you are, I assume, are from Michigan, you may be familiar with the fact that in 1927, there was a horrific situation where a local farmer in Bath, Michigan, a little town just north of Lansing, uh, spent months wiring and uh, setting up uh, a system of wires and bombs and blew up the public school the day before graduation. So it's a story about that horrible event. It's about the town and how, how everyone reacted. And uh, it is grim, but also I think how many people in the town of Bath responded shows how resilient um, they were. Um, so the, thank, thank you, Anne, uh, for that plug. Uh, the, 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 the newest book is called Day of Days. Like Wolf's Mouth is published by Michigan State University Press. Well, thank you, John and Jane, for being here with us today. Um, I very much appreciate uh, your talk. This, uh, this has been good. So right. we're going to get ready to turn things.